It's Toronto's podcast on the Canada's Podcast Network. Today, I'd like to introduce you to Victoria Pladier. Victoria is a corporate executive with over two decades of executive experience. She is a visionary, an innovative leader, and served as an executive for a global Fortune 50 organization and as a board member for several organizations and an entrepreneur owning several businesses. So we have a story of how you can exist in corporate life and still be an entrepreneur. She's also a published author, an in-demand public speaker, and appears regularly on national TV. Victoria, welcome to Canada's podcast. Why don't you t- kick off by you know telling us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do uh, and you know the kind of entrepreneur you are. Great. Thanks for having me. Really happy to be here. Uh, So describing myself, a bit about my background. I am lifelong business to business technology and services leader. I've been in and out of big corporates my entire career as an executive, became an executive at 24. And what I would call an entrepreneur within those organizations, having built uh, new business units, new products, Uh, and service lines, and I've always had the proverbial side hustle uh, that has led itself into an entrepreneur through both startup of uh, of companies as well as acquisition of some, and now subsequently sitting on the board of many and uh, and an investor. That's cool. I mean, can you give us, you know, some examples of that kind of side hustle thing in terms of, you know, organizations and uh, the that you're a part of, you've invested in, uh, et cetera. You know, I mean, it's an interesting kind of situation uh, that we don't really come across too much, but I mean, the active entrepreneur and the active corporate citizen, you know, it, it, you know, li- living, is it a dual life or I don't think you think it is, do you? I don't, I don't, I, um, I do a lot of talking around, you know, women in technology, women in leadership and asked a lot around, how do you balance it all? And my first message is there, there's no work-life balance. It's just life. And so when we talk about my corporate, uh, experience and my entrepreneurial experience, it really, it, it is all one as it relates to sort of my, my career, my profession and my passions, mm-hmm. you know, so for me, the entrepreneurial side began very, very early and out of passion, quite honestly, that then grew into a business. So, and that's some of my career advice, you know, to whether it's even my, my kids who ask me, what do I do when I grow up? You know, it's follow your passion. So the earliest one for me in terms of an entrepreneurial venture was, you know, I have a passion around health, wellness, and fitness. And one of those things was around natural bath and body products. So I somehow got interested during my, you know, very busy 70 hour a week job to coming home and a bit of sanity was, you know, the artistic side making natural bath and body work products, soap. So it started by, you know, you can't make a single bar of soap. You know, you make a a batch. And uh, what became this personal hobby that grew into making presents for, you know, friends at Christmas or other time grew into a huge business. So called natural works Mm -hmm. where it then became a huge production. The family wasn't involved, you know, nanny, my nanny even was involved in the whole process at that point Mm -hmm. uh, that grew actually to full wholesale business, selling it to retailers, et cetera. Uh, I ended up selling it a number of years ago when I, uh, when I moved out of country at the time for work. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that would be number one. Number two is uh, having a wholesale buy and sell business. I am, you know, an avid online shopper and I learned quickly and discovered, you know, suppliers in China or other, um, other parts of the world where I could buy and bring in. Often they were products I personally liked and saw a market for and sold Mm -hmm. them. And I will actually tell you, it is that venture and the, um, you know, the profit that was gained through that business, which I really did off the side of my desk, uh, that um, was actually what funded the acquisition of a company I made, a small company I made uh, a few years ago um, in cash as a result of that. You know, I'm a bit of a, you know, part of me from a corporate standpoint, the reason I love the, uh, the big corporate is there's big big, hairy, complex challenges, you know, that I'm solving for. I've been through 
18 mergers, acquisitions, you know, that, you know, created, you know, so much learning and complexity. And it's a great experience to, to, to take out in, into your own businesses. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So let's move on to a little bit. I mean, I'm actually really interested. How the heck do you manage to live a corporate life? You know, run the, these businesses, as you said, off the side of your desk, you know, and have kids and time and a marriage and all of those kind of things. How the heck do you do that? <laughs> so uh, there's a few things I will tell you. So first of all, you know, my, my mobile phone is an extension. It's rarely disconnected to one of my hands, uh, <laughs> you know, sad or not, but I live by my calendar. That's why it off. looks so strange when I turn mine off at the beginning of the meeting. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, so I'm, it's extreme discipline and time management is number one. You know, the other is uh, I've gotten very good at setting boundaries. You know, so not only, you know, expansive ones in terms of setting lofty objectives and goals for myself, how far do I want to go within those bounds, but also being very clear around um, the things that I'm going to say no to and really focused on understanding what brings value to me professionally, whether that's my corporate world, my the businesses I own and operate, the mentorship I do of other entrepreneurs, and quite frankly, even personally. So if it brings me no joy, there's no value in it, then mm. I've gotten very good at learning how to say no. Okay. So let's, let's move to some more kind of regional things. This is, this is a, a national network. So we're in Toronto or Greater Toronto, if you, if you like, GTHA. You know, what, what are the benefits of doing business here? In Canada, it's, so I've, I've, I'm a very proud Canadian. Uh, I have lived and worked, however, in the, um, each of Canada and the U.S., and there are distinct differences, for sure. I don't think anyone would dispute that. Yeah, totally. uh, you know, I, I, I love doing business with Canadians. It's very, I'm a highly relationship-driven leader. Mm -hmm. You know, the way I approach life and business is, you know, recognizing that people do business with people they like and they trust and they want to do business with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and Canadians, you know, I've lived in New York uh, and worked there and it's just, it's a very different, you know, there aren't smiles necessarily on the subway while you're, tra you know, you're commuting, et cetera. And yeah. so I enjoy that aspect. That's actually what's enabled me to be as successful as I am, I think is because I've spent a significant amount of time focused on building relationships and generally Canadians, you know, are incredibly open and accepting and will engage in those so easily. So it makes it. You know, I approach, you know, any new relationship I'm, I'm entering into from a place of generosity and not greed. I'm not there to immediately do the hard sell, but because we establish a relationship, which is so easy to do, it naturally ends up in, you know, into us at some point, if not immediately down the road, being able to work together. So this is always a nice thing. You know, we're all entrepreneurs are creative. So, uh, you know, we need to have great ideas. Uh, and, you know, how do you disconnect, recharge, you know, how do you get inspired? Because, you know, we're, we're grinding along with either the corporate world or, or our own businesses or whatever. You know, how do you manage to take time to get to, to, get to, you know, to find that, 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 that spark, if you like? Yeah, so I'll tell you, one of the um, most sacred times for me is actually my gym time in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm not, I'm not big on meditating or yoga or quiet time uh, because I find it hard to calm and quiet the brain, period. But so I've blocked my calendar in the morning. I found people were booking me for very early morning meetings. And I said, mm -hmm. no, no, like I get up at 4.30 or 5, depending on when my first meeting of the day is, mm -hmm. and I work out at the gym headphones on. I kind of vacillate between podcasts, which I do love listening to and music. Mm -hmm. And in between sets or even while I'm working out, mm -hmm. like that's the moment where these great ideas come. So I'll find I'll just finish. I, I'm heavy. Like I do a lot of weight training, you mm -hmm. know, a minute or so between sets, you'll catch me on my phone because I'm emailing myself a reminder that I need to follow up on this or do that. Or I have this great idea that I want to research a little more. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, you're great because you've got this corporate thing and this entrepreneurial thing. 
one of the best things about what we all about being an entrepreneur, you know, why are you just happy here? You know, what, why, 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 why here as well? There's something, yeah. There's something yeah. there. Yeah, it's for me, it's, um, I mentioned earlier, you know, that in the corporate setting, it's this, you know, massive, you know, really, really complex and hairy with, you know, managing thousands of, you know, of, of individuals. And so that satisfies one side of, um, you know, my appetite. But the other side, you know, is the ability to be nimble, to make decisions quickly, to test and act ideas and see how well um, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be received by the market. That's incredibly difficult to do in most large corporate organizations. So mm -hmm. being an entrepreneur, you know, enables me, you know, to do that, uh, to, you, you talked about sort of being creative and I, I view a lot of it around creativity, right? Mm -hmm. Working very directly on marketing materials for the products and services, you know, that, you know, I would buy, or I think that there's a market for, you know, that whereas in a corporate world, you know, I've got a whole marketing team who does that and I might not actually be able to play in that space. Mm -hmm. So I have, for me, it's the best of both worlds, the complexity and challenge of this massive organization that I'd aspire to build my own business to. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, having a smaller business or businesses that it can be, be involved in and feel like I, der you know, derive immediate near term value and just, I get so much joy out of. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I get that. Well, you know, you're you're in because you're in the corporate world. Kind of interesting. What do you think is that? You know, maybe you can pass on a couple of gems. Is a fad right right now? You know that people should be should be aware of. And, you know, and not get not go too far down that road because you you're seeing stuff at the corporate side, and they do tend to get involved in. In, in fads and, and they're not very productive. Maybe you can't, I mean, I'm just curious. Um, you, know, talk to you. you don't have to answer it. <laughs> yeah, from a corporate or, or from an entrepreneurial perspective? Both, both, both. Um, you know, so, uh, I don't know that it, so there, I'll, I'll say, so there's a massive skills gap and one that's, the train's coming hard and fast, which is from a corporate perspective, we need to be prepared for, but actually serves incredibly well for, from an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial perspective. Mm -hmm. And even for those who are looking to move towards that path, the whole notion of side hustle, the gig economy, mm -hmm. right? And how we need to be prepared for that. I, I don't think in the many corporates are not yet prepared for how they're going to address that. Mm -hmm. So it's not a fad. It's just something that's coming that there might be, you know, near term fads in terms of um, what they're looking to do to address and supplement with the gig economy. But then on the entrepreneurial side, it's how do you how do you capitalize on that? I think there's an incredible market around that. So when you look at you know, kind of how do you transform the talent and the needs of organizations with some of these you know niche skills that are coming down the pipe, uh, you know, would definitely be one. Well, that's good. You're doing the entrepreneurial thing. Making a challenge an opportunity. I like <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, what's what's the greatest challenge you faced uh, today in in business? Hmm. Well, I don't think there's a lot. You know, personal and business. I, I'm not sure. I don't, you know, I don't think. I'm not, I, maybe some yeah, people I, can separate them. I'm not sure. The yeah, I, I, it's hard to separate. I think you know the biggest challenge, and this comes on the corporate side. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, as an entrepreneur, you, until you go public, uh, you know, you don't have some of the same challenge. So my, I've worked for mostly very large global publicly traded organizations mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, are very focused on quarterly results. Mm -hmm. And that for me is, you know, it's a, it's a necessary evil, but at the same time, it challenges a little bit of that sort of values, um, system. As I mentioned earlier, my focus on relationships. Mm -hmm. you know, Simon Sinek has a new book called The Infinite Game, right? And business is an infinite game. And in these large corporations who look at quarter to quarter results and the short term gets prioritized sometimes over the longer infinite game. So for me, that's a challenge between, you know, we do the right thing by our clients. If we want to be their trusted advisor and build relationships mm -hmm. for the long term where they're going to continue to want to buy directly from you, then it's this 
very fine line between serving the needs of the shareholders and the organization itself with those you know, uh, you know, that are buying from you, it's the, that constituent. So that for me has always been a challenge because I, I don't often like the trade-offs that it feels as though we're forced to, to make. So from a leadership perspective, that's one I've been pretty vocal on, you know, that I think the, sh you know, focused on that longer term infinite game, uh, you know, will, will ultimately lead to greater success, but a, a challenge in that environment for sure. What are the what are the top three things on the on your bucket list vision board, whatever you want to use uh, at, the, at the moment? Uh, top three things. Well, I had one that I had to cross off a few years ago, which was to make the top forty under forty, and they stopped it for a few years um, and then brought it back after I turned forty. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but the next one would be I I want TED Talks to come to me. I want to stand on that stage. Uh, you know, big one, um, you know, and deliver and talk about sort of my journey around being unstoppable. One of my mottos is no hashtag, no excuses. I sign a lot of my, you know, social media posts. Mm -hmm. you know, so that would be a big one. Yeah. Um, and, you know, ultimately I'd love to, you know, become CEO of, you know, a significantly larger organization than those I've been CEO owner, uh, you know, of in the past. Whether that again be in the corporate world or you know on the, uh, an entrepreneurial venture through acquisition or, or, or organic growth. So, you know, when you're faced with an unexpected challenge, how do you typically handle them? You know, we, we all handle them differently. Maybe I'm, I'm interested. Mm. I am. Um, so I'm a. It's funny, despite being very type A and I talked about living by my, you know, calendar and schedule and dis all of that discipline, at the same time, I also, there's a lot of a go with the flow and there's a little bit of gut feel in that. So for me, I, um, years ago, sadly, my, um, my, my ex uh, passed away and we had shared custody of our children. And um, I was traveling significantly. I was in a role that was based in New York, but living in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after my ex passed away, I had no one to watch my, my children when I traveled for work. And, I you know, so that for me was, I was, I was 18 months into, actually at the, a year into the role. I left after 18 months mm -hmm. with that organization because I needed to make a, a very tough decision. And at this point, here's one of those where you, you know, doing the right thing is a balance between the needs of your family and loved ones and the personal needs you have with those professionally. You know, so for me, it was time to take a very deep breath and assess what's really important to me. And first and foremost, my children, you know, so I needed to make a choice. They were 13 and nine at the time. So after about six months of trying to navigate within that organization I was at at the time to find a new role with less travel, or in a different location, I ultimately made the decision to leave, mm -hmm. you know, to come to a role that had, um, coming back to Canada, it, um, you know, it was a smaller size and scale by nature of our, you know, the size, you know, of our country, uh, but it gave me what I needed, what my children needed for me at the time to be home with them much more, um, you know, to focus on them, you know, so, you know, dealing with that kind of adversity meant, you know, a lot of inward reflection mm -hmm. and being comfortable that I was stepping off the path I had planned for myself for a period of time mm -hmm. to do what was right, going back to sort of that living more, much more holistically, you know, around that focus and what was going to be the best for all. Okay. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? I... Long before Brene Brown became, you know, famous for her uh, vulnerability uh, research and talks, I was actually um, told by a leader that it, his words to me were, you know, it's Victoria, it is okay to be vulnerable. And I realized um, because I became a senior leader and an executive at such a very early age, mm -hmm. I wore a mask. Uh, I wasn't my authentic self in a professional setting. Right. And so there was a, a view of me by many of my colleagues for being super, I, my nickname was the Iron Maiden, quite frankly. Uh, and yet I, I'm a, my best friend calls me turtle, right? Tough exterior, but I'm a marshmallow on the inside. And so 
learning that that's how others viewed me, um, it, that, that was an instant moment uh, for me to stare at myself in the mirror and say, like, I need to change um, the way I'm leading and be the type of leader that I want to work for. Mm -hmm. So having him tell me that it was okay to be vulnerable and hearing I had this nickname I wasn't proud of, that for me is the best advice I've ever gotten because it almost instantly was now it was hard to change some of those behaviors. Um, but I, I made a, I made the switch, you know, and a change, um, to, to become a very different leader. And I think that's helped me because it also, not just in terms of how I lead teams and lead within an organization, but going back to the relationships, how I engaged authentically in building net new relationships as well. Okay, let's go some, to, for some rapid fire questions. You don't get yeah. to think about them, just go for it. Okay. If you weren't, weren't doing what you were doing now, what would you be doing? Uh, I'd be involved in the fitness world somehow. I don't know if I'd be a trainer, but doing something because I love it. Okay. You obviously like reading. What book are you currently reading? I, well, I just finished Simon Sinek. I've heard, all, I've, I've listened to him, uh, his, his book on the infinite game. Mm -hmm. I'm currently still listening to Michelle Obama's Becoming. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to be a, a bit scattered. So I always have like two, three books going at a time. It's okay. <laughs> Some of us do that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a morning or a night person? Morning, by far. Yeah. Seems to be the thing for entrepreneurs. It's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of 80-20. Yeah. Interesting. If you had to pick, and you've covered this a little bit, but just one word to describe yourself, what would it be and why? Unstoppable. Hmm? Unstoppable is my word. Uh, and why? Uh, you know, I come from a very, very difficult childhood and youth. Uh, I was in the child welfare system prior to being adopted uh, and have overcome a lot of adversity. Mm -hmm. And yet my mindset is that nothing is going to stop me. Uh, and so I live very much I with that. I don't, I don't think my children love it because the no excuses <laughs> mindset they don't like to hear. <laughs> is anything keeping you up at night? Um, my, yeah, my brain, I'm now, uh, I, this is, you know, again, being in my forties, I need to use the washroom in the middle of the night, uh, now. And then when I go back to bed, I can't shut it off. So it tends to be just constantly, you know, going. So it's not, there's no kind of stressful moment per se that keeps me up, but rather just, you know, how do I continue at this pace and get everything done that I want? So that literally will keep me up at night. What's your favorite place in the world? You, you know, you're pretty well traveled. What's your favorite place in the world? Uh, two, New York and Paris. Love them, love them. Paris and Edinburgh for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What are three non-negotiables that have to happen in your morning routine? Oh, morning person. yeah. My, I mentioned my workout, your workout. not negotiable uh, yeah. for me. Uh, that's number one. Um, oh, probably over the last couple of years, uh, it's it's watching the news in the in the morning. Mm -hmm. I used to not enjoy that so much, but now I'm a bit of a fiend uh, mm -hmm. in watching and listening to uh, podcasts. And I'm a massive music fan, so although it's coupled with the first one around my workouts, mm -hmm. uh, getting that getting that in as well and getting me getting me moving. Okay, and this is the this is the kind of funny one that we end up with. There's a small tropical island in the middle of the ocean with only one phone booth and no internet. We drop you off there with no technology. You don't get a laptop. You can always use the phone booth to call us and we'll come and get you. How long would you last before making that phone call? And what would you do? Hmm. Uh, four or five days. And I will tell you why four or five days. So mm -hmm. I do love, I love traveling. You mentioned earlier, you know, that you know that I'm a traveler. Uh, and one of my trips per year, at least, is typically to go somewhere south, to go somewhere warm, mm -hmm. and to sit on a beach and mm -hmm. not live by any schedule. Mm -hmm. However, even though I almost always book a seven-day trip, after four or five, I'm done. That's, 
that's all I need. That's kind of the number to recharge me and to go. And I think at that point I would go a little bit crazy and, uh, and need to get out. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's interesting. That's good. Um, well, you know, Victoria, thanks for coming on. That, that, that was a really good, good interview. Uh, and I always like, you know, we've got lots of people that listen that want it, that you spark something with and they want to connect with you. Uh, how can they find you online and, and, and do that? Sure. So I do have a personal website, which is victoriapeltier.me, mm-hmm. but I'm also very prolific on uh, LinkedIn, a uh, large contributor there. So if you Google me, I'll come up as a top hit for Victoria Peltier and likely it'll take you directly to my LinkedIn profile. Mm-hmm. Thanks for coming on the Canada's podcast and, uh, you know, hopefully we might see you again soon. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks for having me.